For these past several weeks, we have been looking at the book of Psalms. Not only what the Psalms say, but what it also means for us. And today we are wrapping up our series on summer Psalms. And I'm just wondering how it's impacted you and influenced your own life as we've looked at these Psalms together. And I also wonder if at any point in time you just sort of said, what's the deal with this book of Psalms? Like, what is it really about? Why is it called that? Why do, what's a psalm? What, was, what do we mean when we call it? And what's the deal with that funny P at the beginning of psalm? Like, why don't we pronounce that? Why is it such a funny word? Well, well the reality is the word psalm in its original language actually is a, is a word that just means song or maybe specifically sung to the stringed instrument. So when we talk about the Psalms, what we're really saying is we're talking about the songs of the Bible. And if you're really curious about that silent P on the beginning of the word, I, I, I have an explanation for it. I don't know if it's going to satisfy you, but it's because in the original language that we get the word Psalm from, it's from the Greek. And the Greek letter that the word starts with is the word Psi. And when we spell that Greek letter Psi out in English, for some reason, we spell it P-S-I. I don't really know. I can't explain it to you, but I know that's why the word psalm is written with a silent P, because we don't pronounce the Greek letter Psi with the P, even though it's there. I don't know if that's good enough for you, but that's why the book Psalm is spelled the way it is. And what's when we talk about psalms, we're talking about the songs of the Bible. The Psalms are the songbook of the Bible. It's all about singing. I'm wondering about you. If you thought about the songbook for your life, what songs do you sing? Like, what ones do you know by heart? Which ones do you find yourself coming back to all the time? What songs are on repeat in your own life? It, for me, it's kind of strange I have an interesting relationship with music because I love music, but I feel like music doesn't actually love me back. Like, I don't have a voice that anybody really wants to listen to. And, and the truth is I have a terrible memory for remembering songs and lyrics and words to music and things like that. I don't know what it is. Like, I can think of my favorite songs that I've sung hundreds of times in my life, and I still can't remember the words to them if you put me on the spot. I don't know what it is. I just can't really remember them. So I love music. I love listening to music. It's It's been so meaningful in my own life. Yet I can't really sing it very well. I don't sound very good when I do. It's like, well, this is my relationship with music. But if I tell you about my own song list, it, I can tell you uh, that it, it includes some of these people and these artists. And you might not believe me, but it starts with some Taylor Swift. I love some T-Swift and listen to her music on a consistent basis. Justin Bieber, he's got some talent too. And I'll listen to him on a regular basis. Mumford and Sons, I love some of their music. These days, Judah and the Lion has been on repeat in my house. Have loved listening to their music. But then there's also some classics. Like, I love some good old U2 or Coldplay. My favorite artist of all time is a guy named Sufjan Stevens. Maybe you've never heard of him, but I love his music. It's kind of eclectic and eccentric and strange and diff. I don't know what I'm trying to say about myself if he's my favorite artist. Um, but I love listening to Sufjan. But even then, it still gets even more obscure from there, I love some artists that not only have you probably never heard about, you probably don't know anybody that's heard of them. I love the Supertones and Satellite Soul, and I love listening to Keith Green. And there's also some room in my songbook, my playlist, for some classics, some, some classical songs as well. I love listening to classical music in my own life. So when it comes to music, let's just say I've got a broad taste, a broad interest in music, but a narrow ability to perform it or sing any of it. It's just the world that I live in. And so when you think about your own life, I wonder how that relates to you. 
when I, when we talk about the Psalms, I think sometimes there's a temptation to think they're kind of all the same. But the truth is, when we look at the Psalms, there's this broad array of types of songs in the Psalms. It's not just all pop songs. They, there are songs that kind of display and speak to the array of emotions that we experience as humans. There's some that are not just not just pop songs, there's some that are like metal songs, you know? Kind of look a little bit edgier and darker. There are some that are alt-rock, just kind of take a little bit different look on things. There's some that are more R&B. There are, there are others that are kind of heavy doses of country music. And the truth is, I think there's even some reggaeton in some of those psalms as well. There are some that are simple and there are catchy. And there are some that are ballads. There are some that are meant to be sung with the whole band. And there are some that are more solos. When you start digging into the psalms, you realize that there's so much richness and diversity and uniqueness to all the different psalms. Sure, in some way they're kind of written in a different time and place and language and different instruments. But they display the entire gamut of what it means to be human these days. The psalms are full of, of what it means to be human in our lives. The Psalms invite us to actually look in all kinds of directions. The Psalms invite us to look upward as we look to God and who God is. The Psalms invite us to look inward to our own lives and what we need most in our own lives. The, the Psalms invite us to look backward on what God has done in our lives and in our world in the past. The Psalms look at, help invite us to look forward to what God is going to do and what he's capable of in our lives. And yet, the Psalms also invite us to look outward, how we are supposed to live our lives and engage in the world around us. And today we're going to be looking at Psalm 63. It's a great psalm that kind of speaks on its own, but we're going to see not only do the Psalms, all 150 of them, invite us to look in all these different directions, but this one psalm is going to invite us to look in all kinds of different directions in our lives as well. So I'm going to read the first eight verses of Psalm 63, and then we're just going to unpack how it invites us to look in all these different directions in our lives. Psalm 63, starting in verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. I have seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and your glory because your love is better than life. My lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live and in your name I will lift up my hands. I will be satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing on my mouth I will praise you. On my bed I will remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night, because you are my help. I sing in the shadow of your wings. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. In some ways, sometimes I open up parts of the Bible, I'm like, what can I possibly preach from this? It speaks for itself. We look at this Psalms and like verse 1, it says, You, God, are my God. The psalm looks up to God, saying, God, it's in you that I trust. And then and later in that same verse, it says, In a dry and parched land where there is no water, my whole being longs for you. In other words, I look inward and I realize, God, what I need more than anything else in my life is you. As I look what my life needs, it is you. The next verse I hit says, I've seen you in the sanctuary and beheld your power and glory. In other words, I look back on my life. And I, and I know what I've experienced from you. And I know what you've done in the past. And I trust that. A few verses later, in verse 4, it says, I will praise you as long as I live. And in your name, I will lift up my hands. In other words, I'm going to look forward to all that you're going to do in my life. And I will praise you and I will trust you in those things. And, and then... At the end of this, it says, I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. 
And he says, I'm going to live my life in a way that I'm going to trust you. I'm going to chase after you with my life. Like There are ways in which this psalm reads, I'm like, what more can I add to that? It tells us exactly who God is, why we can trust him, what we need from him, and how we can move forward in faith, trusting him. But I will tell you, maybe the one thing I can help you, you see and unpack for our, our day today is understanding the context that this psalm is written in. If, you, if you're reading the psalm from your YouVersion Bible app, or maybe you've got a Bible open in front of you, and you go to the very beginning of it, there's a heading at the beginning of this psalm. Before verse 1, it says this, A psalm of David when he was in the desert of Judah. In other words, this is a psalm from one of the heroes of the Bible, King David, the David who killed Goliath and led armies to great victories, is considered one of the most... Uh, most important people in all the Bible, especially before the time of Jesus. But it says when he was in the desert. I don't know if you've ever been to the desert. Do you know what the desert is like? Have you experienced the desert for yourself? I lived in the desert of Arizona before I moved back here to Michigan. And I can tell you, I love parts of the desert. And, and the desert can just be beautiful and it can be a rich place to live. But it's also helpful if you're in the desert to have air conditioning, to have a good supply of like food and water, and to have a plan for, for what you're going to be doing there in the desert. Because if you find yourself alone in the desert, it can be a really harsh place. And so when David is writing from the desert, we realize he doesn't have air conditioning. And he might not even have the provisions that he needs in the desert. He is writing from a dry and desolate place. He's probably writing from a place of fear and concern. The context for him writing this is that he's the king over Israel, but his son Absalom is chasing him, pursuing him, hunting him down, probably to get his status and his title from him. So not only is he alone in the desert, he's also feeling betrayed by his own family. And what I can tell you after spending some years living in the desert is that you don't survive in the desert without being hardy. There are no cute, fluffy little animals or plants in the desert. Everything in the desert is trying to kill you. It's true. Like the littlest things, they're poisonous and they're trying to kill you. The bigger animals, they're hungry and they're going to try to eat you. The plants, they've all got thorns. There are spikes that are like that long. Like everything in the desert is out to kill you. I remember living in the desert in the first few weeks we were there. We had like rattlesnakes in our driveway and we had, we had these wild pigs come through and we had coyotes in our backyard and we had tarantulas in our front yard and black widows. Like everything out there in the desert is trying to to kill you. And that's the place that David is writing from. That desert place, that place that is dry and desolate and lonely and probably scary to him. And this is what he says in the first verse of this psalm written from the desert. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Again, King David is being pursued, chased down by his son, and he's alone. And yet what he says is not, God, I'm so afraid. God, I'm so desperate. Instead, what he says is, God, more than what I need in terms of water or provision or shelter or safety, he says, my whole being longs for you. He says, like, I'm thirsty in the desert. God, I am thirsting after you in my own life. And I don't know if we relate that well to the desert here in West Michigan. Like, we generally have plenty of water and lots of gray skies. Like, we don't necessarily experience the desert. Other than I have been over at the state park hiking and found that there's parts of the dunes that have these funny little cactus. Like, I didn't know Michigan had cactus, but I guess there's not enough water in certain parts 
uh, of our own state parks where cactus can be growing. So when, when, when David writes about being thirsty in the desert, I don't know if we relate to that unless we kind of put this in our own context. And if we think about our own lives, and I think these few last few years have maybe put us all in different situations where we feel like something is missing. Like I'm longing for something more. Things aren't the way they're supposed to be. Like I feel like I am hungry and thirsty for more in my life. And I'm, I'm living this life where I don't even understand how I got here. I wasn't prepared for it. And I'm afraid of what's been happening in my own life and how I'm going to get out of this. And so when we start to put ourselves maybe in David's shoes in the desert, we realize that there are ways in our own lives that maybe we feel like we've been alone, that it's been a season of dryness, that maybe we've been afraid. And I think then we can read this and we can take more out of it. When we realize that we maybe have felt like something's missing, or maybe we feel like we've been longing or in need of something more in our lives. And that's where we see that Psalm 63 points us in these different directions. The first verse looks upward. God, I need you. Like somebody who's alone in the desert with no water. God, I need you like that. And the psalm encourages us to look upward. But then it looks backward. It says, I know what you've done in the past when he says, I've seen you in the sanctuary. The sanctuary to the people of Israel was where they could go to meet with God. They could go to have some sort of encounter or experience of who God was. David's in the desert. There's no sanctuary in the desert. So what he's thinking back to is these times in his life where he's seen God's power at work in his life. He knows that he's met him. He's encountered him. He's had experience of him. And he's looking back on those things saying, if I know what God's done in the past, I can also trust him now and into my future. So he's looking back on what he knows of God to be true in his own life and relying on that. And then he's looking inward. He's saying, what do I need most in life? He's saying, it's not just water. It's not just shelter. It's not just food or protection. He's looking inward and saying, what I need most, God, is to experience you in my life. I need you more than anything else in my life. And then he's looking outward and he's saying, because of who you are, God, because of the way that you've led me, I'm going to respond with my voice and my life. I'm going to sing to you. I'm going to trust you even in this dry and desolate place. And then he looks forward and says, I'm going to trust you with my future. There are challenges ahead of him. There are things that he needs God to provide a way through in his own life. And he says, God, I'm going to trust you even in those things. And what we see throughout this psalm as we look upward and backward and inward and outward and forward in our lives is we see that David's natural response in that dry and desolate place is to sing. It's to sing to God. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I'm in that place where I feel desperate and alone and afraid, sometimes I want to run and hide or we get angry. But David's response was to sing. And I think that's what the Psalms in general invite us to do. They say, even if you're in a place that's, that you're afraid, you feel alone, you feel like you're thirsty and longing for more, instead of running away or hiding or getting angry, it says, sing. That's what the Psalms invite us to do, is to sing. It says in verse 7, because you are my help, I sing in the shadow of your wings. When I first read that, it actually struck me a little funny. I'm like, what does that mean to sing in the shadow of God's wings? God, does God have wings? Is God a bird? But then I realized that David's sharing an image with us. And remember, he's in the desert with no protection, with no provision. And can, can you imagine if you're in the desert and the sun is beating down on you and you are thirsty and you're longing and some great winged bird or creature flew over you and cast its shadow over you? Just for a minute, if you could get a reprieve from the beating sun to be in the shadow, what that would mean to you is something like 
protection and peace. And maybe you'd find the joy to sing from that place. And what we know about David, he did not live his life perfectly, but we knew he was considered to be a man after God's own heart. That he had this ongoing, day in and day out, lifelong relationship with God. Trusting him. Following him. Finding his courage because of who God is. And we find is in that relationship with God that we can find shelter and protection and peace and the joy to sing. Just like David was out in the desert, this dry and desolate place, and he still found the joy to sing because of who God was. He invites us to do the same thing too. I actually, I actually appreciate the, the old translation of Psalm 100 that says, make a joyful noise to the Lord. Like I told you, I don't feel like I've got a great voice that anyone would, would want to hear, but when it talks about making a noise, I can do that. I can be loud. I can make something that maybe nobody else should hear, but I can make a noise. And I know that singing in our world can be kind of intimidating. Like, What if somebody else hears me? What if they hear how off key I am or how bad my voice is? Sometimes we're like, I don't even know how to sing. And it can be kind of intimidating. But when we sing, it's a way we respond to God who he is, what he's done in our lives, how we're trusting him. It's a way that we worship him is to sing with our voices, to sing in the shadow of his wings, to sing, to, to sing in the shadow of his p- protection and his provision and his peace in our own lives. And our dream here at The Journey is not just that we would have the most amazing voices and musicians and singers, but our dream is is that we would all learn to sing together even if it sounds like we're making a joyful noise. That's one of the reasons when you when you spend some time with us at our in-person services, we crank the music up so we can drown you out. So we're not worried about what you might sound like. But we dream of unhindered voices that worship God, that find joy in singing to Him. This is what Verses 3 and 4 says that because of your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. I will praise you as long as I live, and in your name I will lift up my hands. So I'm just going to invite you, wherever you're at, the band's going to follow up with a song in just a second. Maybe for the first time ever, maybe try to sing along. Or the next time you're with us in person. Don't be afraid to use your voice. Nobody's going to judge you. We just want you to use your voice in a way that you would respond to God in worship. It's what the Psalms invite us to do. To join, not just right now, but to join with other people in relationship with Jesus now and in years and generations past that have sung these great songs that have found this songbook of the Bible to be a way that we can find encouragement, we can find hope, and we can find direction to worship God with our songs. Would you pray with me? Hey God, you have created all of us with different gifts and talents, but regardless of how we might feel about our voices, you've invited us to use them to respond to you in worship whether that just sounds like a loud noise or some angelic harmony. God, would we look at the Psalms and see that they point us in all these different directions to look up to who you are, to look back on what you've done, to look into what we need most, to look out on how you want us to live our lives and to look forward how you are going to provide and lead us through the challenges of our lives. God, would you help us have courage and boldness to sing, knowing that you're there to to provide shade and protection and provision and peace and joy and guidance for us. Even when we feel like we're in that dry and desolate place, would our first response be to sing to you. We love you. Amen. Mm